For the best stereo 3D viewing experience, you should watch this movie in a dark room in order to minimize reflection, and sit at least 5 feet away from your screen. When this logo appears and you hear this tone, please remove your glasses. And when this logo appears, please put your glasses back on. You can put them on now. Good morning and welcome to France. My name is Richard and I am a filmmaker and we're here at the Rougemont Manoir in Normandy. It's just a few miles away from D-Day beaches and roughly about 200 miles away from Paris where the Lumiere brothers projected the first film over a century ago. Now, since you're watching this class, I can assume that you are undoubtedly aware that today's process of filmmaking is going through some of the most fundamental changes since the introduction of sound. And I'm talking, of course, about the art of 3D filmmaking. Shooting a stereoscopic film involves some fundamental changes. How to compose a shot, the editing, and how to control the 3D through manipulation of the 3D rake, right here. In order to do a good 3D film, the knowledge has to be really mastered, not only because of artistic reasons, but also because, well, let's face it, if you do bad 3D film, then you're gonna send your audience back home with headaches and dizziness and so on. But if you do it right, you will add a new dimension to your film. So, this course is divided into four chapters. In the first chapter, we're going to explain how Stereo 3D works. We're going to start in with the principles of Stereo 3D, then go on with understanding a Stereo 3D image. In the second chapter, we're going to show you how to create good stereo for any screen size, because in the Stereo 3D world, screen size changes a lot of things. At that point, we're going to be able to understand how to build the stereo in an image and learn the tips for good stereo. At the end of chapter 2, we're going to have a good idea as to how to build a well-balanced stereoscopic image. So we're going to step into the process of actual stereo shooting in the third chapter, called Methods of Stereo Shooting. After introducing 3D rigs, we'll explain the two necessary steps to shoot in 3D. The first step, adjusting the far parallax, and the second step, adjusting the interaxial, which is the distance between the two cameras. In the fourth and final chapter, we'll review 3D tools and techniques. We'll talk about how Stereo 3D changes the pre-production process, then move on to production and the additional challenges of post-production, and then we'll conclude with a summary of the entire course. Chapter 1. How does Stereo work? A. Principles of Stereo 3D 1. Depth perception requires your eyes to turn inwards. I know, I'm very lucky to be standing here with this beautiful French countryside behind me, where everything is in focus, with a variety of depths. And as your attention is moving from object to object, it can either go deeper into the distance, or it can stay close to the foreground. And the angle at which your eyes would aim, compared to each other, would change automatically. Now look at something very far. I don't know if you can see, there's a horse behind the tree over there. Or pick a tree. 
Now, basically, your eyes are going to be parallel to each other. Now, if you look at something closer and your eyes begin to tilt in and you end up literally cross-eyed. So, the point is learning how to move your audience's eyes in order to trick their brains in believing this existence of depth. That's the basics. To perceive objects at different depths, your eyes must turn inwards. The closer an object is, the more your eyes must turn inwards. When an object is far away, your eyes are parallel. Two, fusing images to not see double. In real life, I have a perception of depth, but where does it come from? Well, the basic idea is this. If I look straight ahead and I put my finger in front of my eyes, then my left eye sees my finger more to its right, and my right eye sees my finger more to its left. If I want to see my finger clearly, then I have to cross my eyes. That's how my brain knows it's close. Now that process is called fusion. By crossing my eyes, I allow my brain to fuse the images of my finger. When we turn our eyes inward to look at an object, we fuse our two eyes images so we don't see double. Fusion is an automatic reflex. Your brain tries to fuse the images of every object it sees. Fusion is the process of superimposing the two images of an object. Fusion creates the sensation of distance. Images fused when my eyes are parallel. The object feels far. Images fused when my eyes are turned inwards. The object appears close. A small percentage of the population has difficulty doing this, usually due to one eye being slightly crossed or wall-eyed compared to the other. Three, one image for each eye, the reason for 3D glasses. Now, what I want is to use the same perception of depth in a movie. So, well, we'll do what technology does best, which is imitating nature. So we'll use two cameras, okay? And then we'll present the left image to the left eye and the right image to the right eye. And that's exactly what the crew is doing. They're shooting with two cameras. So how are we going to do that? Deliver the left image only to the left eye and the right image only to the right eye? Well, the idea is this. We'll project both images on the screen superimposed. Then a system is going to separate the images so the right eye only gets the right image and the left eye only gets the left image. The most common and efficient system today is glasses. How did they work? Well, there are several types. Let's start with systems that reproduce true colors like the ones used in theaters. Most passive glasses today use polarized lenses. A polarized filter is put on the projection system, which gives the light of one image linear or circular polarization, and the light of the other image the opposite polarization. Both images then arrive at the viewer. The glasses have opposite polarizations for each eye, so the left lens blocks the right image and vice versa. This system requires a special silver screen that maintains the polarization as the light is reflected back to the viewer. This technique is used by the most common system in the United States, the real D system. There is another type of passive lenses. They're called spectral division glasses, like the Dolby 3D system. The principle is similar, but instead of separating the left and right images using two different polarizations, spectral division uses two slightly different sets of primary colors. In European theaters, the most common system uses active glasses, like the expand system. On home computers, NVIDIA does the same thing. It doesn't require a special screen, but the glasses are much more expensive. 
In this system, images for the left and right eyes are sent one after another on the screen, 144 or 120 times per second. The glasses' lenses are synchronized with the projection system so that each eye becomes alternatively opaque or transparent to show that eye its own image. Stereo 3D simulates fusion. Though different systems use different technologies, all of them make it so the viewer's left eye sees one image while their right eye sees another. Passive Polarized Stereo 3D Projection Images for both eyes are projected simultaneously but with different polarizations that correspond to the polarization of each lens of the glasses. Requires a special silver screen. Passive Spectral Division Stereo 3D Projection Images for both eyes are projected simultaneously on a standard white screen with different wavelengths for red, green, and blue. Glasses lenses filter correspondingly. Active Stereo 3D Projection Shutter Glasses Images for each eye are projected sequentially on a standard white screen. The lenses in the shutter glasses go alternatively transparent or opaque in sync with the projector. Four, Antiglyph Glasses. There's another very common method for image separation. It's compatible with any medium from TV screens to standard paper, the good old Antiglyph system. All right, so that's what your left eye sees. And this is the image your right eye sees. Now. If you take the anaglyphs, only the red light goes through the red lens while the cyan image is blocked, and vice versa. Now go ahead, try on the glasses. Good. You can put them on and off whenever you want to see how the image is built. This method produces poor color reproduction, low brightness, and often shows some ghosting, but it's extremely easy to use and works just about everywhere. Furthermore, looking at an anaglyph image without glasses can be extremely instructive in helping you understand how the stereo of the image is built. So, take your glasses off now and I'll show you how to build anaglyph images in post-production. It's quite simple. We remove the red component from the right image, which then becomes cyan. Then, we take the blue and green components of the left image, which becomes red. We first superimpose these left and right eye images, then add them together, and that's our anaglyph image. It works for both color and black and white images. To have one image for each eye, passive anaglyph stereo 3D projection, Images for both eyes are projected simultaneously on any medium, with one image red and the other cyan. The anaglyph glasses show the red image to the left eye and the cyan image to the right eye. Anaglyphs are tiring, brightness and color reproduction are poor. But they can work with any medium, paper or any type of screen. B. Understanding a Stereo 3D Image 1. The Parallax of an Object All right, so let's take an object. Um, the slate, perfect. Can I have it? Thank you. So let's look at the slate. If I place it right here. Now the space between the left and the right image of an object is called its parallax. Now you can notice that the left image is on your right and the right one is on your left. That's because it's close. So your left eye has to look over here and your right eye has to look over here. They're basically forced to cross. 
So your brain knows and thinks it's close. So this parallax is called crossed parallax or negative parallax. Now, this slate here has a big negative parallax, about 2% of the total width of my image. And because it's a negative parallax, we actually say negative 2%. When I was standing right here, I was at negative 1% parallax, right here. Good, here, thank you. Now, behind me, the window is at 0% parallax, which is also your screen level. Whatever is beyond the window will appear behind your screen level. And whatever is in front of the window will come out of your screen to a certain degree. If you superimpose a frame from the left camera onto the same frame from the right camera, you'll find that most objects will appear in different places within the two frames. For any given object, the distance between its two images is called its parallax. It is talked about as a percentage of the total image width. Positive parallax. The eyes are straight, therefore the object feels far. Negative parallax. The eyes are crossed, therefore the object feels near. Two, the screen plane. When you're looking at the window, it's like you're looking at a 2D image. No parallax, no differences between the two eyes. It just appears on your screen, since your two cameras are filming exactly the same thing. And that's called the screen plane. Whatever is in front of the screen level is a negative parallax. And whatever is behind the screen level is a positive parallax. Now, if you stick a little piece of paper next to me on your screen, mm -hmm. that should help you to define your screen level. And I should be right in front of the little piece of paper. The screen plane is the distance to the camera where objects have their left and right images exactly superimposed. These objects appear at the projection screen's depth. They are directly on the screen. They have a 0% parallax, meaning they will appear in precisely the same place in both the left and right eye's images. All objects farther than the screen plane have a positive parallax value and appear behind the screen. All objects closer than the screen plane have a negative parallax value, and they appear in front of the screen. So, let's try a small exercise. Is the parallax of this bridge negative or positive? And what about the parallax of this text? The parallax of the bridge is positive. It appears behind your screen. And the parallax of this text is zero. It appears right on the screen plane. Three, why do far objects appear far? So look at those trees. The left image is on the left and the right one is on the right, which is normal, being far away. But why is it normal? Let's say this is a screen where you're watching the course. Whatever it is, a computer screen or a TV screen or 
even a big theater screen, if you're lucky enough. So, look here, I'm going to do a little drawing for you. So, if the image of a tree meant for your left eye is here, and the one for your right eye is over there, then your eyes are forced to uncross as if they were looking farther. So your left eye looks over here and your right eye looks over there. So now your eyes see the same tree, okay? Together, they just fixated the tree and your brain fused both images. And because you uncrossed your eyes, you have the impression that the tree is far away. You're following? Good. That's the exact opposite of forcing the eye to cross. And it is therefore called uncrossed parallax or positive parallax. In real life, when you look at a distant object, your eyes are parallel. In a stereo 3D image, an object appears to be far away when your eyes need to be parallel in order to fuse the left and right images together. Thus, an object appears far when the left image is on the left and the right image is on the right. That's positive parallax. Four, 2.5 inches, 6.5 centimeters the artificial horizon. Now, let's suppose the distance between these trees is 6.5 centimeters or 2.5 inches, which is the average distance between the human eyes, okay? Then it means each eye is going to look straight ahead, completely parallel, just like they would do if you looked at something on the horizon, which means any background that has a positive parallax of 6.5 centimeters or 2.5 inches is going to appear as the farthest object you can see. Now, if the space between my two trees here is more than 6.5 centimeters or 2.5 inches apart, well, My right eye is going to try to look this way and my left eye the other way. But human eyes, they can't diverge. You can't look at this cross and at this cross at the same time. So either your audience will see your background doubled or worse, their eyes are going to start to hurt and to the point they, they could eventually throw up. And that's extremely important. It means your far parallax. The parallax for the farthest object in a scene can never be more than 6.5 centimeters, 2.5 inches on the screen. That's an absolute value. Regardless of a projection on a 20 feet wide theater screen or a 70 feet wide IMAX screen. So, the problem is when you shoot an image well, a certain distance between two points will, of course, appear bigger on a bigger screen. The class you're watching right now would appear bigger on an IMAX screen. And that very small parallax you can see between those trees on a computer screen would probably be about 10 inches wide. That's four times larger than the 2.5 inches, meaning the distance between your eyes you begin to understand the problem, right? Well, you should actually adapt your shooting conditions to the screen size on which you intend to project your film. Even though when you're shooting, you probably won't know what your screen size is gonna be. So, before actually getting into shooting 3D, let's look at what depth we want for what image and for what screen. But don't freak out. There are plenty of solutions. 2.5 inches or 6.5 centimeters is the average distance between an adult's eyes. 
If an object has 2.5 inches or 6.5 centimeter positive parallax on the projection screen, also called screen parallax or screen offset, then it will appear as the farthest object you can see. For this reason, it is called the artificial horizon. When projected, if an object has more than 2.5 inches or 6.5 centimeter positive screen offset, the viewer's eyes won't manage to fuse the images because they can't diverge. Therefore, the viewers will see this object doubled and their eyes will hurt. The term far parallax refers to the parallax of the background or farthest objects in the scene. It can be far, like our trees, or relatively close, like the wall at the far end of a room. Going further. It is sometimes difficult in an anaglyph image to distinguish the left eye's image from the right one's. Let's look at this image in more detail. The tree there is far. It's logical then to expect that its left image, the red one, is on the left, and the right image, the cyan one, is on the right. But now, let's look at this same tree, but on a light background. Now the left image is still on the left, except this left image now appears as cyan, not red. Why? Because at the spot where the left image hides the light background, the background of the right image is still there, and that background is cyan. So when I add the small red component of the dark object, the result still appears as cyan. That's why the left image of a dark object on a light background appears cyan and not red. Chapter 2. Creating good stereo for any screen size. A. Screen size. 1. The effect of screen size. Hi. As you can see, in this chapter, we chose a stronger depth effect so you can see what it is and get used to it. Okay, we now have an idea of what a stereoscopic image is. We now know that if we want a background like a mountain or some trees to appear very far on a theater screen, then their parallax should be 6.5 centimeter or two and a half inches or a little less. Now, a lot less would give poor depth to the image. More would hurt some eyes. Now, 6.5 centimeter or two and a half inches on a 6.5 meter or 21 foot screen is 1%. Just like the background here. 1% of my image. Now, what if I want to use a 13 meter or 42 foot screen? The 1% of my image is going to be 13 centimeters or about five inches, which is too much. What about a computer screen? Well, 1% might not be enough for the background. We're not going to shoot three times for three screens, or three sizes. So we have to find a way to adapt. When we shoot, parallax values are measured as a percentage of image width. When we project, these parallax values can lead to screen parallax values that are too large or too small, depending on screen size. Therefore, we may need different versions of the film for different screen sizes. In order to get maximum stereo depth, one should place the background at a maximum screen parallax of 2.5 inches, 6.5 centimeters, the artificial horizon, which means 1% parallax for a screen width of 21 feet, 6.5 meters, 0.5% parallax for a screen width of 42 feet, 13 meters, and 0.25% parallax or less for IMAX. Two, the solution, shifting the images in post-production. The curtain's parallax is positive 1% because it's far. Well, it's not far like the trees we saw in the last chapter. 
but we'll stick with positive 1% anyway. By sticking with 1% for the background, we can utilize the entire stereo depth available and give a strong feeling of depth. So, now, if we want to project on a 42-foot screen, what's going to happen? Well, let's say we have our left image, the red one in anaglyph, our right image, the cyan one, and let's say our farthest object's images are separated by 1% of the image width. Their parallax is 1%. Then, if we push the cyan image, for example, to the left, we reduce this separation and their parallax is reduced. So, to sum things up, in post-production, we've shifted the entire image to the left. There was a 1% parallax for the far objects. We've shifted the whole image by 0.5% of its width. So, the parallax of the far objects is now only 0.5%, and the image is now fit for a 42-foot screen. Which means subtracting 0.5% parallax from the whole image. So now the far parallax is only 0.5%, and we can project on a 13 meter or 42 foot screen. After shooting, one needs to adapt the background parallax to the size of the screen. This is done to set the far parallax to 2.5 inches, 6.5 centimeters, the average distance between our eyes, the artificial horizon. Therefore, one needs to horizontally shift the left or right image in relationship to the other. We shift by a certain number of pixels or a percentage of image width that we call the post-production shift or HIT, horizontal image translation. It usually goes from 0% to 3%, but sometimes more. Three, the effect of the post-production shift. But wait, I just shifted everything in my image, not just the background. So let's go back a bit and look at what happened to my out of screen effects, like this lamp right here. Look, yeah, can you do it again? Now see, the negative parallax of my lamp just got bigger by 0.5%. So basically, my background, the Q-Rag, the curtains, the wall, went from 1% to 0.5%. And my lamp here, from negative 2% to negative 2.5%. I just shifted everything by negative 0.5%. So let's look at what happens with it. Now everything appears to shift towards the viewer. Remember, I have to do this if I want to project on a bigger 13 meter or 42 foot screen. So, everything just got a little closer. Both the background and the out of screen effects become closer to the viewer. Look, can you do it one more time? Shifting the images affects the visual depth of all objects, far objects and close objects alike. As a result, it also shifts the screen plane. To adapt an image that was shot for a 21-foot screen to a 42-foot screen, one needs to apply a negative 0.5% post-production shift. A negative 0.5% post-production shift has these effects. 
The background at 1% artificial horizon for a 21 foot screen will go to 0.5% artificial horizon for a 42 foot screen. The out of screen effects at negative 2% strong will go to negative 2.5% very strong. Therefore, the whole image seems closer and the screen plane is pushed back further from the camera by 0.5%. Four, small screens, big screens. So basically, it means that the bigger the screen is, the less parallax you can have for the background in terms of the image size percentages. The more the out of screen effects you're gonna have, which is logical, the bigger the screen, the bigger the theater, and the more you'll have in front of it. Let's try a few exercises. On a huge screen, like an IMAX screen, can I get significant depth behind the screen? In other words, in large positive parallaxes? No. On an 84-foot IMAX screen, the maximum positive parallax is 0.25%, which is 2.5 inches. That means that most objects are going to be in front of the screen. In fact, on these huge screens, some stereographers choose to only use negative parallaxes. Everything is in front of the screen, and the far objects are 0% on the screen. Here's another exercise. On a small screen, a cell phone screen for example, can I get significant out-of-screen effects? No, because small screens are often very close to the viewer, so even small parallaxes force the eyes to converge far too much to fuse the images. This limits the negative parallaxes for small screens. In these cases, one needs to push the stereo back behind the screen. On small screens, big out-of-screen effects are impossible because of the screen's closeness. Therefore, on these small screens, it is often better to push back most of the stereo behind the screen. On large screens, large positive parallaxes for the background run the risk of making the viewer's eyes diverge. Therefore, on these big screens, a larger part of the stereo is in front of the screen. 5. The post-production shift in practice. So, I have to export one version for each size of screen from my editing station, changing my post-production shift each time. Fortunately, an upcoming digital cinema server technology is going to do this at projection time. So one version is going to work everywhere. To wrap it up for a second, let's ask Luke to play with bigger shifts. Now, this is a big positive shift. This might be uncomfortable for you if you have a big screen, so let's keep your suffering within reason. Look, and this was a big negative shift. Now, the out of screen effects are huge and everything is in front of the screen. After editing, one needs to adapt the background to each screen size. Therefore, there is one version of the film for each screen size. One needs to shift the images in post to place the background at 1% to 2.5% for small screens, 1% for a 21 foot screen, 0.5% for a 42 foot screen, and 0.25% or less for an IMAX screen. B. Building the stereo in an image. 1. Increasing the stereo depth in an image. Now, we're going to test a few things. We know we can shift the depth of the image, 
But what about expanding the total depth of my image? Here, the parallax is negative 1.5%. Then it goes from here all the way up to 0%, and then to the QREC here, 1%. That's my far parallax. Now, what if I went up to negative 3% for the tip of the pool table? Let's try that. Okay, now let's try negative 4% in front. Now, negative 5%. Don't strain your eyes. And this is negative 6%. You can stop it now, Anthony. What if I went up to negative 3% for the tip of the pool table? Let's try that. Okay, now let's try negative 4% in front. Now, negative 5%. Don't strain your eyes. And this is negative 6%. You can stop it now, Anthony. Okay, back to normal Anthony, please. Anthony is the director of photography, by the way. So he does that by increasing the distance between the two cameras. Quite logical. If the distance between my eyes was bigger, I would see more depth. A post-production shift only shifts the object in an image towards or away from the viewer. To actually change the total stereo depth of an image, one needs to change the distance between the cameras, called the interaxial. Two, measuring the total stereo depth, the parallax range. What we changed just before is called the parallax range of my image. It's a way to quantify an image's depth. The parallax range is the range between the closest object plane, here, it's negative 2%, and the farthest object, which is the background plane here, is at positive 1%. So, in this image, I have 3% parallax range to play with, to shift all I want in post-production depending on the type of screen my viewers are going to use. The parallax range of an image is a measure of its total depth. The parallax range of an image is the range between the parallax of the farthest object, often 1% for a film shot for a 21-foot screen, and the parallax of the closest object, usually negative 0.5% to negative 2%. Three, choosing the stereo for small screens. Now, for a bit of theory, there's a lot of debate about what type of parallax range is acceptable in an image. Let's talk about small screens first. The size of a computer screen, or a television. With small screens, more things have to be behind, inside the screen. It's more like a window to another world, a world that doesn't pop out of the screen that much. So it's not uncommon to shift everything towards positive parallaxes, away from the viewer until the background is 2% or 2.5%. At 3% parallax range, still talking about small screens, almost everybody can instantly see the depth in a well-constructed image. Some go up to 5% or even more, with most of it behind the small screen. For small screens, most of the scene should be behind the screen. A good start is 1.5% to 3% parallax range. Background between 1% and 2.5%. The limit of 2.5 inches, 6.5 centimeters screen offset doesn't apply because all screen offsets are going to be much less than that anyway. Four, choosing a stereo for big screens. For big screens, let's say four meter or 12 foot wide or more. The problem is a little different. As we said, going over 6.5 centimeters or 2.5 inches for 
far background, it's impossible for viewers to fuse the images. The eyes can't diverge. So, for a 6.5 meter screen or 21 foot wide, the positive parallax can never go beyond 1%. Or 0.5% for 13 meter screen, even less for IMAX. Hollywood animated 3D films are often very conservative in terms of parallax range. It's often lower than 2% for most shots. They have different versions for different screens, but for standard 13 meter screen, the background parallax is 0.5%, and the out of screen effects rarely go beyond negative 0.5%, or even sometimes negative 1%, except for shots with special depth effects, like that, for example, or that which can be problematic if I stay up here. For big screens, never go over 2.5 inches or 6.5 centimeter screen offset for the background. Hollywood usually uses conservative values for parallax ranges, 1.5% or 2% maximum, sometimes even less. Some think this yields disappointing stereo, Others argue that it is well balanced and easy to watch for all viewers. So, what type of parallax wrench you are going to use is up to your taste and vision. A rule of thumb is that 2 to 3% is going to work with every type of screen with different versions in post-production. That kind of parallax range is gonna work well with a 13 meter or 42 foot screen with a far parallax set at 0.5% and a close parallax at negative 1.5%. It's going to work with a 6.5 meter or 21 foot screen. The far object's plane is positive 1% and the closest object's plane is negative 1%. And it's also going to work with small screens but the small screen case is special. With the small screens, it's often better to put most of the image behind the screen. The background at 2% and no out of screen effects at all, or only a few, for example, at negative 1% if your parallax range is 3%. A good start for an image that works for all screen sizes. Parallax range, 1.5% to 3% maximum. When in doubt, go for a smaller range. In post-production, we shift according to what we saw in the beginning of this chapter. Far parallax at the artificial horizon for each screen size. That is 1% to 2.5% for small screens, 1% for 21-foot screens, 0.5% for a 42-foot screen, and 0.25% or less for an IMAX screen. C. Tips for good stereo. 1. Non-stereoscopic depth cues. The borders of these small screens are often extremely visible, so it's advisable to make sure that most of what's on the sides of the image is near the screen plane, so it blends better with the real borders of the screen. Let's practice a bit. In this image, where's the screen plane? Well, it's there, at the level of the beginning of the bank. This allows the image to blend better with the right border of the screen. This is one of the numerous effects that allows you to build a better 3D image. In fact, this leads us to a larger problem. Big out-of-screen effects that are cut by frame borders at a different depth can be quite disappointing. That's right. Look at this character who's walking towards us until he's in a very strong out-of-screen effect. This gives us a really weird impression. The stereo says he's in front of the screen, while his legs, masked by the frame's edge, makes us think that he's behind the screen. This very common problem is called a stereoscopic window violation, or SWV, and it should always be avoided, especially if you intend to project your image on a small screen.
This can sometimes be also true for big screens, though the large, the larger field of view and the black area surrounding the image helps the viewer to forget where the screen plane is. These types of factors which enhance depth per perception sorry, are called non-stereoscopic depth cues. In the case of a stereo window violation, the non-stereoscopic depth cue that contradicts the stereo is called object masking. For your brain, close objects always mask far objects. You can use this effect dynamically to enhance the depth perception of your audience by using moving shots, especially crane or lateral dolly shots, where close objects move faster than far objects and mask them. There are many different kinds of non-stereoscopic depth cues that can help build a better 3D image. A perspective running from the borders to the insides of the frame usually works very well. Use to your advantage geometric lines like railroads, streets, roads, skyscrapers, and so on. Also, try to use shadows, both the ones objects cast on the ground and on themselves. They give important cues about location of objects, but also about their 3D texture. That's why some directors of photography, when they work in 3D, like to use more directional lights to emphasize shadows. And you can also use texture gradation, the size of objects, and even air transparency. In large landscape shots or smoky rooms, fog or smoke are for your brain a good indication of distance, and it enhances the perception of depth. What you must always remember is, the more depth cues you give to your audience, the better their depth perception will be. So give them some 3D information. For example, try to avoid large monochromatic zones like pure blacks in a dark room or pure white skies. They yield no information, no detail. All these can literally make or break a shot. So, let's apply what we've learned for a bit. This image seems a little uncomfortable to look at for most people. The stereo looks weird, especially when the soccer player appears. Why is that? Well, first, the total parallax range is about 5%, which is too much for many people, especially on a big screen. Secondly, the stereo of this shot is not well built. There are only two planes to compare. There's nothing between the background and the foreground, no points of comparison. This makes it difficult for us to feel the distance between them. Finally, this image clearly lacks non-stereoscopic depth cues. The shadows aren't well defined, the building size is difficult to gauge, the sky is totally white, and perspective and air transparency simply don't help us at all. Going further. In real life, the distance between our eyes is fixed. But by playing with the interaxial of our cameras, we can create interesting effects. For example, make your audience feel like they're giants. We are not used to seeing big objects with depth. To see a building as a whole, we need to be far from it. And since our depth perception is severely reduced after about 100 feet, the building appears to us as depthless. If we give it back its depth by using an interaxial much bigger than our eye separation, it will tend to look like a model or give the viewer the perspective of a giant, especially with a high angle shot. This well-known effect is called giganticism and must be taken into account, particularly when your cameras are far from the action, as is often the case with live-action sports or concerts. Conversely, with very small interaxials, we can shoot very small objects that we don't really see in 3D in real life, because we look at them so closely that we actually only use one eye. In this case, the small interaxials will produce the opposite effect, and the viewer will get the perspective of an ant. It is often a good idea to shift in post to put the objects that are close to the borders of the frame on the screenplay.
Perspective effects and reference objects that recede into the distance really help the brain perceive depth. Depth perception is comparative. Putting several objects at different depths and using oblique planes to visually guide depth progression often looks good. Few objects with dramatic parallax differences often look disappointing. Objects' textures often help perceiving depth. Smooth, plain objects often yield less visible depth. Never underestimate the importance of these factors when composing a shot. The main non-stereoscopic depth cues are relative size, objects appear smaller with distance, object masking, close objects mask far objects, motion parallax, near objects move faster than far objects, perspective, straight lines that recede into the distance, texture gradient, far objects show less texture detail, air transparency, more distant objects appear less distinct, cast shadows, Object shadows enhance depth. Okay, now, before getting our hands dirty and actually shoot some images, I'd like to show you a little trick. <laughs> when I was young, I always wanted to go to some 3D projections. And I always wondered how it could be possible for objects to appear so close. And it was a big mystery to me. So, let's think this through. Two, the perceived distance of an object. Okay. Now, for the mystery. Let's say my two eyes are looking at a cinema screen. Say there is an outer screen teapot with a negative parallax equal to 6.5 centimeters or 2.5 inches, which is 1% on a 6.5 meter or 21 foot screen. This is the image of the teapot for the left eye. Left eye, the image. And this one is for the right eye. As you can see, this is negative or crossed parallax. My eyes will have to cross in order to fuse the images. And I will have the impression that the object here at half the distance between me and the screen. Now, if the object has a negative parallax of twice as much, then the yellow triangle is going to be twice the size of the one at the bottom. Hence, the apparent distance of the object is going to be closer. It's going to be a third of the distance between me and the screen. Now, on a 13 meter or 42 foot screen, if I stick to our choice of 3% parallax range, my background plane is going to be 0.5%. So my closest object is going to be negative 2.5%, which is five times the distance between my eyes. So this object will appear to be a sixth of the distance between me and the screen which could be as close as two meters or six feet or less, or even arm's length for people close to the screen. And that's why when you look at an image on your computer or on a small TV screen, the closer you are, the less depth the image has, because all the depth in the image is proportional to my distance to the screen. Going further. We can deduce from what we've seen that the actual reach of out-of-screen effects depends on two things. First, it depends on the physical screen offset between the left and right images. For example, if this screen offset is negative 2.5 inches or negative 6.5 centimeters, then the object will appear at half the distance between the viewer and the screen. Secondly, it depends on where the viewer is. In our example, if she's six feet from the screen, the out-of-screen effect will only be three feet, but will be at arm's length, 
Whereas if the viewer is 30 feet from the screen, the out of screen effect will be huge, 15 feet, but it will be too far for the viewer to grab. If one can control these two parameters, screen offset and viewer position, one can place out of screen effects extremely precisely for amazing results. This is often used in stereo 3D attractions, which mix film and real world elements. Of course, you can only have this kind of control when your film will be displayed in a single fixed venue of known size. So, that's it. The mystery from my childhood had just been solved. I'm feeling really emotional right now. Um, okay, so much for theory. Now, tomorrow we'll get down to business and we'll actually shoot some images. An object's perceived distance is proportional to the viewer's distance from the screen. That's why being close to a screen can yield relatively flat images. In a theater, an object with a negative screen offset equal to average eye separation appears at half the viewer screen distance. A negative screen offset of twice average eye separation makes the object appear even closer, a third of viewer screen distance. 